Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part two of History of the Jesuits by G.B. Nicolini. History of the Jesuits, Chapter 1, 1500 through 1540, Origin of the Order. The 16th century presents itself pregnant with grave and all-important events. The old world disappears, a new order of things commences. The royal power, adored with this signorial prerogative snatched from the subjugated barons, establishes itself amidst their ruined castles, beneath which lies buried the feudal system. Mercenary armies, now constantly maintained by the sovereign, render him independent of the military services of his subjects, and formidable alike to the foreign foes and to turbulent nobles. The monarchs advance rapidly towards despotism. The people subside into apathetic submission. Europe has become the appendage of a few masters, Henry VIII of England, Francis I of France, and Charles V of Spain share it among them, but not content with their respective dominions, they fought among themselves for the empire of the whole, or at least for supremacy of power. Henry, having retired from the contest after the Electoral Congress of Frankfurt, the other two continue the strife with varying success. The gold of the recently discovered Western world and his immense possessions give to Charles an enormous power. The bravery of a warlike nation makes formidable the chivalrous spirit of the indomitable Francis. Their wars ridden Europe with blood, yet produce no decided result. Meanwhile, as a compensation for these evils, the human mind, casting off the prejudices and ignorance of the Middle Ages, marches to regeneration. Italy becomes, for the second time, the center from which the light of genius and learning shines forth over Europe. Leonardo da Vinci, Tizano, Michelangelo are the sublime, the most divine interpreters of art. Poggi, Ariostro, Poliziano gave a new and creative impulse to literature, and are the worthy descendants of Dante. Scholasticism, with its subtle argumentations, vague reasonings, and illogical deductions, is superseded by the practical philosophy of Lorenzo and Machiavelli and by the irresistible and eloquent logic of the virtuous but unfortunate Savonarola. Men who for the last three centuries have been satisfied with what had been taught and said by Aristotle and his followers, who, as the last and incontrovertible argument, had been accustomed to exclaim, Epse Dixit, now begin to think for themselves, and dare to doubt and discuss what had hitherto been considered sacred and unassailable truce. The newly awakened human intellect eagerly enters upon the new path and becomes argumentative and inquiry to the great dismay of those who deprecated diversity of faith, and the court of Rome Depending on the blind obedience of the credulous, athematizing every disputer of the papal infallibility, views with especial concern the rising spirit of inquiry and has to tremble for its usurped power. Fortunately, the last three popes had bestowed little or no attention on the spiritual affairs of the world and made no effort to combat the new ideals. Borgia amid his insidious debaucheries, had been solely intent upon suppressing by poniard and poison the refractory spirit of the Roman barons, and upon acquiring new territories for his cherished Caesar, a son worthy of such a father. Julius, in his noble enterprise of ridding Italy from foreign domination, was a great deal fonder of cask and caress than of the Soma of St. Thomas or any other theological book. Leo, son of that Lorenzo, rightly called Magnifico, 
had inherited his father's love of art and literature and of every noble pursuit. Magnificent, generous, affable yet dignified in his manners, living amidst every luxury. The center of the most splendid court in the world, he exhibited the characteristics of a temporal prince rather than those of the supreme pontiff. He took a greater interest in the stanza of Aristo or a statue by Michelangelo than in all the writings of the scholastics, of which, in fact, he knew very little. The impartial and accurate Sarpi says of him, he would have been a perfect pontiff if to so many excellencies he had united some knowledge in the matter of religion and a little more inclination to piety. Two things about which he seemed to care but little. He laughed heartily when some of his more bigoted prelates pointed out to him the imminent perils to religion and the church from the rapid spread of the new and dangerous doctrines. He viewed the quarrels between the Dominican and Augustine friars much in the same light in which Homer is supposed to have regarded the Battle of the Frogs and Mice, and was at last roused from his indifference only when Luther attacked not any article of faith, but his pretended right of selling indulgencies to replenish his coffers and provide his sister's dowry. Yet even then he would have preferred a compromise to a religious war. Had his fanatical courtiers participated in his prudent scruples, the Roman Church might have long retained Germany and many other European countries under her yoke. But God in his wisdom had ordained otherwise to a very submissive letter which the reformer addressed to the Pope, appealing to him as to a judge. The court of Rome replied by a bull of excommunication. Upon this, Luther renewed his anxious investigation of the Holy Scriptures with increased ardor and, becoming more and more powerfully convinced that he had been propounding nothing but the word of God, fearlessly cast aside all idea of a reconciliation and stood firm in support of his doctrines. Previously, he might have been inclined to keep in abeyance some of his private opinions, but now he had come to consider it a deadly sin not to preach the truth as expressed by God in his holy word. The German princes, partly persuaded of the truth of Luther's doctrines, partly desirous to escape the exacting tyranny of Rome which drained their subjects' pockets, supported the reformer. They protested at Spires, and a small cauldron made preparations to maintain their protest by arms. In a few years, without armed violence, but simply by the persuasive force of truth, the greater part of Germany became converted to the reformed faith. The honest indignation of Zwinglius in Switzerland and conspiring with the diffusion of the truth, the unbridling passions of Henry VIII in England alike rescued a considerable portion of the respective countries from the Romish yoke. In France and in Navarre, who new doctrines found many warm adherents. Whilst in Italy itself, at Brista, Pisa, Florence, nay even at Rome and at Faenza, there were many who more or less openly embraced the principles of the Reformation. Thus, in a short time, the Roman religion, founded in ancient and deep-rooted prejudices, supported by the two great powers in the world, the Pope and the Emperor, defended by all the bishops and priests who lived luxuriously by it, was overturned throughout a great part of Europe and let us here admire the hand of divine providence as if with the special view of facilitating the rapid diffusion of the reformed religion that was given to the world but a few years before and in that same Germany where it took its rise the most wonderful and efficient instrument for the purpose, the art of printing, without the press, Lutheran's doctrines would never have spread so widely in so very few months, as at the time, so has it since become an effective means of political as well as religious enfranchisement.
Hence the hatred of the popes and their brother despots towards this staunch supporter of liberty. But while the word of God was thus rescuing such multitudes from idolatry, the spirit of evil, curious at the escape of so many victims, whom he had already counted his own, made a desperate effort to retrieve his past and prevent future losses. He saw, with dismay, divine truth like a vast and ever-extending inundation, rapidly undermining and throwing down, one by one, his many strongholds of superstition and ignorance, and, with the despairing energy of baffled malignity, he set about rearing up a bulwark which should check the tide ere its work of destruction was completed. For this bulwark, he divested the since-famous order of the Jesuits, which arose almost simultaneously with the establishment of the Reformation. So we may say, the Roman Catholic writers, however, ascribed the origin of the Jesuits to a far different influence. They declare that as from time to time new heresies have afflicted the church of God, so he has raised up holy men to combat them, and as he raised up St. Dominic against the Albigenses and Vaudois, so he sent Loyola and his disciples against the Lutherans and Calvinists. It is of this renowned and dreaded society that I propose to write the history. As a matter of course, the first few pages will contain a biographical sketch of its bold and sagacious founder, to whom altars have been consecrated and who is still regarded as the type and soul of the order. Inigo, or as commonly called, Ignatius Loyola, the youngest of eleven children of a noble and ancient family, was born in the year 1491 in his father's castle of Loyola at Gipuzka in Spain. He was of middle stature and rather dark complexion, had deep set, piercing eyes, and a handsome and noble countenance. While yet young, he had become bald, which gave him an expression of dignity that was not impaired by a lameness arising from a severe wound. His father, a worldly man, as his biographer says, instead of sending him to some holy community to be instructed in religion and piety, placed him as a page at the court of Ferdinand V. But Ignatius, naturally of a bold and aspiring disposition, soon found that no glory was to be reaped in the antechambers of the Catholic king, and delighted in military exercises, he became a soldier, and a brave one he proved. His historians, to make his subsequent conversion appear more wonderful and miraculous, have represented him as a perfect monster of iniquity. But, in truth, he was merely a gay soldier, fond of pleasure, no doubt, yet not more debauched than the generality of his brother officers. His profligacy, whatever it was, did not prevent him from being a man of strict honor, never backward in time of danger. At the defense of Papaluna against the French in 1521, Ignatius, while bravely performing his duty on the walls, was struck down by a ball, which disabled both his legs. With him fell the courage of the besieged. They yielded, and the victors entering the town found the wounded officer and kindly sent him to his father's castle, which was not far distant. Here he endured all the agonies which generally attended gunshot wounds, and an inflammatory fever which supervened brought him to the verge of the grave, when, oh, miracle, exclaims his biographer, it's being the eve of the feast of the glorious saints, Peter and Paul, the prince of the apostles appeared before him in a vision and touched him, whereby he was, if not immediately restored to hell, at least put in a fair way of recovery. Now the fact is that the patient uttered not a syllable regarding his vision at the time. Nevertheless, we are gravely assured that the miracle was not the less a fact. Be this, however as it may, Ignatius undoubtedly recovered, though slowly. During his long convalescence, he sought to beguile the tedious hours of irksome inactivity 
passed in the sick chamber by reading all the books of night errantry which could be procured. The chivalrous exploits of Rollins and Amadises made a deep impression upon his imagination, which, rendered morbidly sensitive by a long illness, may well supposed to have been by no means improved by such a course of study. When these books were exalted, some pious friend brought him the lives of the saints. This work, however, not suiting his taste, Ignatius at first flung it aside in disgust, but afterwards, from sheer lack of better amusement, he began to read it. It presented to him a new phase of the romantic and marvelous, in which he so much delighted. He soon became deeply interested and read it over and over again. The strange adventures of these saints, the praise, the adoration, the glorious renown which they acquired, so fired his mind that he almost forgot his favorite paladins. His adorant ambition saw here a new career opened up to it. He longed to become a saint. Yet the military life had not lost its attractions for him. It did not require the painful preparation necessary to earn a saintly reputation, and was, moreover, more in accordance with his education and taste. He long hesitated which course to adopt, whether he should win the lures of a hero or earn the crown of a saint. Had he perfectly recovered from the effects of his wound, there is little doubt but that he would have chosen the laurels. But this was not to be. Although he was restored to health, his leg remained hopelessly deformed. He was a cripple for life. It appeared that his restorer, St. Peter, although upon the whole a tolerably good physician, was by no means an expert surgeon. The broken bone of his leg had not been properly sat. Part of it protruded through the skin below the knee, and the limb was short. Sorely, but vainly, did Ignatius strive to remove these impediments to a military career which his unskillful, though saintly surgeon, had permitted to remain. He had the projecting piece of bone sawn off and his shortened leg, painfully extended by mechanical appliances, in the hope of restoring it to its original fine proportions. The attempt failed, so he found himself, at the age of 32, with a shrunken limb, with little or no renown, and, by his incurable lameness, rendered but slightly capable of acquiring military glory. Nothing then remained for him but to become a saint. Saintship being thus, as it were, forced upon him, he at once set about the task of achieving it with all the ardor which he brought to bear upon every pursuit. He became daily absorbed in the most profound meditations and made a full confession of all his past sins, which was so often interrupted by his passionate outburst of penitent weeping that it lasted three days. To stimulate his devotion, he lacerated his flesh with the scourge, and abjuring his past, he hung up his sword beside the altar in the church of the convent of Montserrat. Meeting a beggar on the public road, he exchanged clothes with him and, habited in loathsome rags of the mendicant, retired to a cave near Manresa, where he nearly starved himself. When he next reappeared in public, he found his hopes almost realized. His fame had spread far and wide. The people flocked from all quarters to see him, visited his cave with feelings of reverent curiosity, and, in short, nothing was talked of but the holy man and his severe penance. But now the evil spirit began to assail him. The tender conscience of Ignatius began to torment him with the fear that all the public notice had made him proud that while he had almost begun to consider himself a saint, he was, in reality, by reason of that belief itself, the most heinous of sinners. So embittered did his life become in consequence of these thoughts, that he went well nigh distracted. But God supported him, and the tempter, baffled in his attempts, fled. Ignatius fasted for seven days, neither eating nor drinking, went again to the confessional, and received absolution. 
was not only delivered from the stings of his own conscience, but obtained the gift of healing the troubled consciences of others. This miraculous gift Ignatius is believed to have transmitted to his successors, and it is in a great measure to this belief that the enormous influence of the Company of Jesus is to be attributed, as we shall see hereafter. Now that Ignatius could endure his saintship without being overwhelmed by a feeling of sinfulness, he pursued his course with renewed alacrity, yet it was in himself by no means an attractive one. In order to become a perfect Catholic saint, a man must become a sort of misanthrope, cast aside wholesome and cleanly apparel, go about clothed in filthy rags, wearing hair cloth next his skin, and, renouncing the world and its inhabitants, must retire to some noisome den, there to live in solitary meditation, with wild roots and water for food, daily applying the scourge to expiate his sins, of which, according to one of the disheartened doctrines of the Catholic Church, even the just commit at least seven a day. The saint must enter into open rebellion against the laws and instincts of human nature, and consequently against the will of the Creator. And, Although it cannot be denied that some of the founders of monastic orders consciously believed that their rules were conductive to holiness and eternal beatitudes, nevertheless, we may with justice charge them with overlooking the fact that as the transgression of the laws of nature invariably brings along with it its own punishment a certain evidence of the divine displeasure. True holiness cannot consist in disregarding and opposing them. Ignatius, however, continued his life of penance, made to the Virgin Mary a solemn vow of perpetual chastity, begged for his bread, often scourged himself, and spent many hours a day in prayer and meditation. What he meditated upon, God only knows. After a few months of this aesthetic life, he published a little book which much increased his fame for sanctity. It is a small octavo volume and bears the title Spiritual Exercises. Note, by the term Spiritual Exercises, Catholics understand that course of solidarity prayer and religious meditation, generally extending over many days, which candidates for holy orders have to perform in the selection of a convent previous to being consecrated. Again, when a priest incurs the displeasure of his superior, he is sent as sort of a prisoner to some convent, there to perform certain prescribed spiritual exercises, which in this case may last from one to three weeks. As this work, the only one he has left is the acknowledged standard of the Jesuits' religious practice and is by them extolled to the skies. We must say a few words about it. First of all, we shall relate the supernatural origin assigned to it by the disciples and Pangrest of its author. He, meaning Ignatius, had already done much for God's sake, and God now rendered it back to him with usury. A courtier a man of pleasure, and a soldier. He had neither the time nor the will to gather knowledge from books. But the knowledge of man, the most difficult of all, was divinely revealed to him. The master who was to form so many masters was himself formed by divine illumination. He composed the spiritual exercises, a work which had a most important place in his life and is powerfully reflected in the history of his disciples. This quotation is from Cretanito Joli, Volume 1, Page 18, an author who professes not to belong to the society, but whose book was published under the patronage of the Jesuits, who he says open to him all the depositories of unpublished letters and manuscripts in their principal convent, the Jeju at Rome. He wrote also a virulent pamphlet against the great pontiff Clement XIV, 
the suppressor of the Jesuits. Hence, we consider ourselves fairly entitled to rank the few quotations we shall make from him as among those emanating from the writers that belong to the order, and we are confident that no Jesuit would ever think of repudiating Cretanita Jolie. This author proceeds to state that, in the manuscript in which Father Giovanni narrates in eloquent Latin those strange events, it is said, This light shed by the divine will upon Ignatius showed him openly and without bell the mystery of the adorable trinity and other arcana of religion. He remained for eight days as if deprived of life. What he witnessed during this ecstatic trance as well as in many other visions which he had during his life, no one knows. He had indeed committed these celestial visions to paper, but shortly before his death he burned the book containing them, lest it should fall into unworthy hands. A few pages, however, escaped his precautions, and from them one can easily conjecture that he must have been from day to day loaded with still greater favors. Chiefly was he sweetly ravished in contemplating the dignity of Christ the Lord and his inconceivable charity towards the human race. As the mind of Ignatius was filled with military ideas, he figured to himself Christ as a general fighting for the divine glory and calling on all men to gather under his standard. Hence sprang his desire to form an army of which Jesus should be the chief and commander, the standard inscribed, Ad Maiorum Dei Gloriam. With difference to M. Jolie, we think that a more mundane origin may be found for the exercises in the feverish dreams of a heated imagination. Be this as it may, however, we shall proceed to lay before our readers a short analysis of it, extracted from Cardinal Weisman's preface to the last edition. He says, This is a practical, not a theoretical work. It is not a treatise on sin or on virtue. It is not a method of Christian perfection, but it contains the entire practice of perfection by making us at once conquer sin and acquire the highest virtue. The person who goes through the exercises is not instructed, but is made to act, and this book will not be intelligible apart from this view. The reader will observe that it is divided into four weeks, and each of these has a specific objective to advance the exertative an additional step towards perfect virtue. If the work of each week be thoroughly done, this is actually accomplished. The first week has for its aim the cleansing of the conscious from the past and of the affections from their future dangers for this purpose. The soul is made to convince itself deeply of the true end of its being, to serve God and be saved, and the real worth of all else. This consideration has been justly called by St. Ignatius the principle or foundation of the entire system. The Cardinal assures us that the certain result of this first week's exercise is that sin is abandoned, hated, loathed. In the second, the life of Christ is made our model. By a series of contemplations of it, we become familiar with his virtues. Enamored of his perfections, we learn, by copying him, to be obedient to God and man. Meek, humble, affectionate, zealous, charitable, and forgiving. Men of only one wish and one thought, that of doing every God's holy will alone. Discreet, devout, observant of every law, scrupulous performers of every duty. Every meditation on these subjects shows us how to do all this. In fact, makes us really do it. The third week brings us to this. Having desired and tried to be like Christ in action, we are brought to wish and endeavor to be like unto him in suffering. For this purpose, his sacred passion becomes the engrossing subject of the exercises. But she, being the soul, must be convinced and feel 
that if she suffers, she also shall be glorified with him. And hence the fourth and concluding week rises the soul to the consideration of those glories which crown the humiliations and sufferings of our Lord. Then, after a highly figurative eulogium upon the efficacy of the exercises, duly performed, the reverend prelate proceeds to show that the one essential element of a spiritual retreat, for so the exercises reduced to action are popularly called, is direction. In the Catholic Church, no one is ever allowed to trust himself in spiritual matters. The sovereign pontiff is obligated to submit himself to the direction of another, in whatever concerns his soul. The life of a good retreat is a good director of it. The director modifies, according to certain written rules, the order of the exercises to adapt them to the peculiar character of the exercitant, regulates the time employed in them, watches their efforts, and, like a physician prescribing for a patient, varies the treatment according to the symptoms exhibited, encouraging those which seem favorable and suppressing those which are detrimental to the desired result. Let no one, says the Cardinal, think of undertaking these holy exercises without the guidance of a prudent and experienced director. It will be seen that the weeks of the exercises do not mean necessarily a period of seven days. The original period of their performance was certainly a month, but even so, more or less time was allotted to each week's work according to the discretion of the director. Now, except in very particular circumstances, the entire period is abridged to 10 days. Sometimes it is still further reduced. It will be observed from the above extracts that the Cardinal, ignoring the fact that the sinner's conversion must be affected entirely by the operation of the Holy Spirit, seems to regard the unregenerated human soul merely as a piece of raw material, which the director may, as it were, manufacture into a saint simply by subjecting it to the processes prescribed in the exercises. In regard to the merits of the book, I cannot agree either with Wiseman or a very brilliant Protestant writer, who, speaking of the approbation bestowed on it by Pope Paul III, says, Yet on this subject the chair of Knox, if now filled by himself, would not be very widely at variance with the throne of St. Peter. The book certainly does not deserve this high eulogium. However, it cannot be denied that, amidst many recommendations of many absurd and superstitious practices proper to the popish religion, the little volume does contain some very good maxims and precepts. For instance, here are two passages to which I am sure not even the most anti-Catholic protestant could reasonably object. At page 16, it is said, Man was created for this end, that he might praise and reverence the Lord his God, and serving him, at length be saved. But the other things which are placed on the earth were created for man's sake, that they might assist him in pursuing the end of creation. Whence it follows that they are to be used or abstained from in proportion as they benefit or hinder him in pursuing that end. Wherefore, we ought to be indifferent towards all created things, in so far as they are subject to the liberty of our will, and not prohibited, so that, to the best of our power, we seek not health more than sickness, nor prefer riches to poverty, honor to contempt, a long life to a short one, but it is fitting, out of all, to choose and desire those things only which lead to the end. And again, at page 33, the third article for meditation is to consider myself, who or what of a kind I am, adding comparisons which may bring me to a greater contempt of myself, as if I reflect how the whole multitude of mortals is, as compared with the angels and all the blessed, after these things, I must consider what, in fact, all the creation is in comparison with God the Creator Himself. What now can I, one mere human being, be, 
Lastly, let me look at the corruption of my whole self, the wickedness of my soul, and the pollution of my body, and account myself to be a kind of ulcer or bowl, from which so great and foul a flood of sins, so great a pestilence of vices, has flowed down. The fourth is, to consider what God is, whom I have thus offended, collecting the perfections which are God's peculiar attributes, and comparing them with my opposite vices and defects. Comparing, that is to say, his supreme power, wisdom, goodness, and justice, with my extreme weakness, ignorance, wickedness, and iniquity. But then the above exercises are followed by certain additions, which are recommended as conducting to their better performance. Some of these are very strange. For instance, the fourth is to sit about the contemplation itself, now kneeling on the ground, now lying on my face or on my back, now sitting or standing and composing myself in the way in which I may hope the more easily to obtain what I desire. In which matter, these two things must be attended to. The first, that if, on my knees or in any other posture, I obtain what I wish, I seek nothing further. The second, that on the point in which I shall have attained the devotion I seek, I ought to rest without being anxious about pressing on until I shall have satisfied myself. The six, that I avoid these thoughts which bring joy as that of the glorious resurrection of Christ, since any such thought hinders the tears and grief for my sins, which must then be sought by calling in mind rather death or judgment. The seventh, that, for the same reason, I deprive myself of all the brightest of the light, shutting the doors and windows so long as I remain there, in my chamber, except while I have to read or take my food. At page 55, we find, in the second week, the fifth contemplation is the application of the senses of these contemplations mentioned above, after the preparatory prayer with the three already mentioned preludes. It is eminently useful to exercise the five imaginary senses concerning the first and second contemplations in the following way, according as the subject shall bear. The first point will be to see in imagination all the persons and noting the circumstances which shall occur concerning them, to draw out what may be profitable to ourselves. The second, by hearing, as it were, what they are saying, or what it may be natural for them to say, to turn all to our advantage. The third, to perceive by a certain inward taste and smell how great is the sweetness and delightfulness of the soul imbued with divine gifts and virtues according to the nature of the person we are considering, adapting to ourselves these things which may bring us some fruit. The fourth, by an inward touch, to handle and kiss the garments, places, footsteps, and other things connected with such persons, whence we may derive a greater increase of devotion or of any spiritual good. This contemplation will be terminated, like the former ones, by adding, in like manner, Pater Noster. At page 52, among things to be noted is the second, that the first exercise concerning the incarnation of Christ is performed at midnight, the next at dawn, the third about the hour of mass, the fourth about the time of the vespers, the fifth a little before supper, and on each of them will be spent the space of one hour, which same thing has to be observed henceforward everywhere. Loyola's next step towards holiness was a pilgrimage to Palestine to convert the infidels. What he did in the Holy Land, we do not know. His biographer tells us only that he was sent back by the San Friscan friar who exercised there the papal authority. On his homeward voyage, Ignatius conceived that a little learning would perhaps help him in the task of converting heretics 
and thus furnished him with an additional chance of rendering himself famous. So after his return, he attended a school at Barcelona for two years, where a full-grown man of 34, he learned the rudiments of the Latin language, sitting upon the same bench with little boys. Having failed to make any proselytes to his extravagancies at Barcelona, he went to Alcala and studied in the university newly erected there by Cardinal Jimenez. Here he attracted much public notice by the eccentricities of his fanatical piety. He wore a peculiar dress of coarse material, and by his fervid discourse contrived to win over to his model of life four or five young men whom he called disciples, but he was regarded with suspicion by the authorities who twice imprisoned him. He and his converts were ordered to resume the common garb and to cease to expound to the people the mysteries of religion. Indignant at this, Ignatius immediately set out for Paris where, in the beginning of 1528, he arrived alone his companions having deserted him. His persecutions at Alcala had taught him prudence, so that, although his attempts at notary in Paris in the way of dress, manners, and language brought him before the tribunal of the Inquisition, he nevertheless had managed matters so cautiously as to escape all punishment. Here, while attending with the difficulties of the Latin grammar, Author's note, once for all, I promise my readers that I am not going to trouble them with the narrative of all the miraculous legends related concerning Loyola. They are in most instances so absurd as to be beneath the dignity of history, that the two following suffice as specimens. It is said that the devil, determined to prevent his learning Latin, so confused his intellect that he found it impossible to remember the conjugation of the verb aho, whereupon he scourged himself unmercifully every day, until by that means the evil spirit was overcome, after which the saint was soon able to repeat aho in all its tenses. Again, when Ignatius was in Venice on his way to the Holy Land, it is said that a wealthy senator of that city, Trivisani by name, Wallace luxuriously reclining on his bed of down, was informed by an angel that the servant of God was lying upon the hard stones under the portico of his place, whereupon the senator immediately arose and went to the door where he found Ignatius. He was ever revolving in his vast and capacious mind some new scheme for fulfilling his desires and gratifying his passion for renown. But as yet, he knew not what he was destined to accomplish. There seems no ground for supporting that he could have already have formed the gigantic and comprehensive project of establishing, on the basis on which it now stands, his wonderful and powerful society. No. He only contrived, as he had done in Spain, to enlist some followers over whom he could exercise an absolute control for the furtherance of any future project, and this, his success had far succeeded his expectations. The magnanimous and heroic Xavier, the intelligent and interesting Le Fevre, the learned lines the noble and daring Rodriguez, and some three or four others acknowledged him as their chief and master. It may at first sight appear strange that such privileged intelligences should have submitted themselves to a comparatively ignorant ex-officer, but when it is bore in mind that Ignatius had a definite end, towards which he advanced with steady and unhesitating steps, Wallace, his companions, had no fixed plan, that he was endowed with an iron will, which neither poverty, nor imprisonment, nor even the world's contempt could overcome, that, above all, he had the art to flatter their respective passions, 
and to win their affections by using all his influence to promote their interest. It is less surprising that he should have gained an immense influence over these inexperienced and ingenious young men, on whose generous nature the idea of devoting their lives to the welfare of mankind had already made a deep impression. Moyola's courage and ambition were strongly stimulated by the acquisition of disciples so willing and devoted, so efficient for his purpose, so attached to his person, and he began to consider how he might turn the devotion to the best account. After some conferences with his companions, he assembled them all on the Day of Assumption, 16th August. 1534, in the church of the Abbey of Montmartre, where, after Peter Lee Febre had celebrated Mass, they each took a solemn vow to go to the Holy Land and preach the gospel to the infidels. Ignatius, satisfied for the present with these pledges, left Paris in order, as he asserted, to recruit his health by breathing his native air at Loyola before setting out on his arduous mission, and doubtless also to find solitude and leisure in which to meditate and devise means for realizing his ambitious hopes. His disciples remained in Paris to terminate their theological studies, and he commanded them to meet him again at Venice in the beginning of 1537, and joining them, Meanwhile, if anyone should ask them what religion they professed, to answer that they belonged to the Society of Jesus, since they were Christ's soldiers. Our saint preceded them to Venice, where he again encountered some difficulties and a little persecution, but he endured all with unflinching patience. Here he became acquainted with Pierre Carafa, which afterwards became known as Pope Paul IV. This harsh and remarkable man had renounced the bishopric of Theate to become the companion of the meek and gentle Saint Jeton of Tyan, and with his assistant had founded the religious order of the Theatans. The members of this fraternity endeavored by exemplar living, devotion to their clerical duties of preaching and administering the sacraments, administering to the sick, to correct the evils produced throughout all Christendom by the scandals and immoral conduct of the regular and secular energy. To Carafa, who had already acquired great influence, Ignatius attached himself, became an inmate of the convent he had founded, served patiently and devotedly in the hospital which he directed, and shortly became Carafa's intimate friend. This fixed at once the hitherto aimless ambition of Loyola. He conceived the idea of achieving power and fame, if not as the founder of a new order, at least as the remodeler of one already existing. With this design, he submitted to Carafa a plan of reform for his order and strongly urged its adoption. But Carafa, who perhaps suspected his motive, rejected his proposal and offered to admit him as a brother of the order as it stood. This, however, did not suit Ignatius, whose proud nature could never have submitted to play even the second part, much less that of an insignificant member in a society over which another had all power and authority. He therefore declined the honor and at once determined to found a new religious community of his own. Aware, however, of the difficulties he might have to overcome, he resolved to proceed with the utmost caution. Being under a vow to convert the infidels in the Holy Land, he gave vow that to this work alone were the lives of himself and his companions to be devoted. Accordingly, as soon as they arrived in Venice, he sent them to Rome to beg the Pope's blessing on their enterprise, as he said, and also no doubt to exhibit them to the Roman court as the embryo of a new religious order. The reason assigned by his historians for his not going to Rome along with them is that he feared that his presence there might be prejudicial to them. 
It is just as likely that he was afraid, least beneath his cloak of austatious humility, the discerning eye of Pope Paul might detect his unbounded ambition. At Rome, his disciples were favorably received. The pontiff bestowed the desired benediction, and they returned to Venice, whence they were to sail for Palestine. Here, Ignatius prevailed upon them to take vows of perpetual chastity and poverty. And then, under the pretext of the war which was raging at the time between the emperor and the Turks, they abandoned their mission altogether, so ended their pious pilgrimage. Taking with him Lyne and Lefevre, Loyola then proceeded to Rome and craved attention of the Pope. The chair of St. Peter was at this time occupied by Paul Farnese, that same Pope who opened and in part conducted the Council of Trent, who instigated the Emperor to the war against the Protestants who sent, under his grandson's command, 12,000 of his own troops into Germany to assist in that war, and who lifted up his sacrilegious hand to bless whoever would shed protestant blood. He had been scandalously incontinent, and if he did not, like Alexander VI, entirely sacrifice the interest of the Church and of humanity to the aggrandizement of his own family, Nevertheless, his son received the dukedom of Placentia, and his grandsons were created cardinals at the age of 14, and one of them was intended to be Duke of Milan. However, Paul had some grandeur in his nature. He was generous and therefore popular, and his activity was indefatigable. But Sarpi says of him, that of all his own qualities, he did not appreciate any nearly so much as his dissimulation. By this amiable pontiff, Ignatius and his companions were kindly received. He praised their exemplary and religious life, questioned them concerning their projects, but took no notice of the plan they hinted at of originating a new religious order. But Loyola, was not to be thus discouraged. He summoned to Rome all of his followers, who had remained in Lombardy, preaching with a bigoted fanaticism and calling the citizens to repentance, and gave them a clearer outline than he had hitherto done of the society he proposed to establish. This they entirely approved of and took another vow, the most essential, for Loyola's purpose of implicit and unquestionable obedience to their superior. Admire here the cautious and consummate art by which Ignatius, step by step, brought his associates to the desired point, notwithstanding the repeated refusals of the court of Rome to accede to his wishes. Neither the courage nor the perseverance of Ignatius failed him. After much reflection, he at last thought he had discovered a way to overcome the Pope's unwillingness. Consulting with his companions, he persuaded them to take a fourth vow, viz. one of obedience to the Holy See and to the Pope pro tempore, with the express obligation of going without remuneration to whatever part of the world it should please the Pope to send them. He then drew up a petition in which were stated some of the principles and rules of the order he desired to establish, and sent it to the Pope by Cardinal Contarini. This fourth vow made a great impression on the willy pontiff, yet so great was his aversion to religious communities, some of which were just then the objects of popular hatred and the plague of the Roman court, that he refused to approve of this new one until he had the advice of three cardinals to whom he referred the matter. Gudichani, the most talented of the three, strenuously opposed it, but Paul, who perhaps had by this time penetrated the designs of Loyola and perceived that the proposed society could not prosper unless by contending for and maintaining the supremacy of the Holy See, thought it would be his best policy to accept the services of these volunteers, especially as it was a time when he much needed them. Consequently, on the 27th of September, 
1540, he issued the famous bull, Regimini Militinus Ecclesiasticae, approving the new order under the name, the Society of Jesus. We consider it indispensable to give some extracts from this bull. Paul, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God, for a perpetual record, presiding by God's will over the government of the church. Whereas we have lately learned that our beloved son Ignatius D. Loyola and Peter Lee Fevere and James Lyne and also Claudius Lee J. and Pascasius Bohi and Francis Xavier and also Alfonso Salmaron and Simon Rodriguez and John Cordery and Nicholas D. Bobavia priest of the cities, inspired, as is piously believed, by the Holy Ghost, coming from various regions of the globe, are met together and become associates, and renouncing the seductions of this world, have dedicated their lives to the perpetual service of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of us and of other successors, Roman pontiffs, and expressly for the instruction of boys and other ignorant people in Christianity, and, above all, for the spiritual consolation of the faithful in Christ, by hearing confessions, we receive the associates under our protection and that of the apostolic see, conceding to them, moreover, that some among them may freely and lawfully draw up such constitutions as they shall judge to be comfortable to, we will, moreover, that into this society there be admitted to the number of sixty persons only, desirous of embracing this rule of living and no more, and to be incorporated into the society aforesaid. The above-named ten people were the first companions of Loyola, and, with him, the founders of the society, but the merit of framing the constitution which was to govern it belonged solely to Ignatius himself. He alone among them all was capable of such a conception. He alone could have devised a scheme by which one free rational being is converted into a mere automaton, acting, speaking, even thinking according to the expressed will of another. There is no record in history of any man be him king, emperor, or pope, exercising such absolute and irresponsible power over his fellow men as does the general of the Jesuits over his disciples. In the spiritual exercises, Loyola appears to be merely an aesthetic enthusiast. In the constitution, he shows himself a high genius with a perfect and profound knowledge of human nature and of the natural sequence of events. Never was there put together a plan so admirably harmonious in all its parts, so wonderfully suited to its ends, or which has ever met with such prodigious success. Prompt and hastingly obedience to the commands of the general and for the obedience of the society and ad maiorum dei gloriam, with great elasticity in all other rules, according to the general's good will, are the chief features of the famous constitution, which, as it constitutes the Jesuits' code of morality, we shall now proceed to examine, doing our best to show the spirit in which it was dictated. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the links below. Thank you so very much.